you can hurt me again. Um, Nietzsche looks at that renunciation of revenge, that renunciation of, oh, you hurt me, now I'm going to hurt you back, as that's a sign of weakness. Because what I'm allowing myself to do, insofar as I continually turn the other cheek, is I put myself in a position of um, being dominated, right? I put myself willfully in oppressive stance. I allow myself to, um, and, and, and my powers, the little that they are, to be subsumed by some higher authority, or some higher figure, or some higher power, right? Uh, the problem for Nietzsche is, is one that's sort of viscerally obvious, right? Um, and I, I'm not trying to make light of it, but the point is your destruction, your domination, your oppression is inherent in your subservience, right? I'll say that again. Your oppression, your domination um, is inherent in your subservience insofar as you embrace um, a metaphysics of subservience, then your domination and oppression is inherent in your act of subservience, right? Um, this is one of the reasons why when people say, oh, why are you as a black scholar studying Nietzsche and da 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 da, my point is that this concept helps me as a scholar. Uh, it helps me specifically as a black scholar, right? For any oppressed person, it doesn't have to be just black people, but for any oppressed group, for any oppressed identity, for any marginalized identity, the idea that, that assuming a subservient metaphysics and a, a metaphysics of willful obedience and um, sort of domination allows one to be objectified, marginalized, oppressed. Well, you have to understand that there must be, there must be some conceptually legitimized sense in which wrath isn't always bad, anger, violence isn't always bad, right? This is a very tricky game to play. Franz Fanon talks about sort of justified use of, of, of anger, of violence, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of commentary within marginalized community on the legitimate use of, of violence. Um, uh, Paulo Freire talks about um, violence and the appropriate use of violence and, um, and such. Martin Luther King talks about civil disobedience and a refusal to obey commands and laws that are specifically put into place to oppress marginalized populations. Time and time again, there is an appropriate use of disobedience and maybe even arguably violence to some extent in order to preserve the peace or to pr protect one's identity or, or group affiliation, right? So the idea that, you know, revenge on all accounts is holistically bad, resistance on all accounts is ho holistically bad, you should never at all resist, you should always um, embrace a metaphysics of subservience, I, you know, as a marginalized person, I can't accept that. Nietzsche is, is I, I can't express how important Nietzsche is extremely useful in articulating why assuming this stance is problematic. Number four, lastly, weakness is a form of pacification, right? Weakness becomes a form of pacification, right? There's that, there's that famous line, the pacification of the Negro, right? But pacification in any sense, the idea, pacification meaning, meaning to, to sort of uh, placate, to, to, to hush. In Jamaica, Jamaica we say, you know, hush, hush, hush. Like, to, to silence, to quiet, to just, you know, accept the lot that you've been given in life and be pleased with that, right? Don't ask for too much, you know, do what you're told, stay in your place. Because if you don't, then the judgments. Right? Now I'm going to use my power to tell you what to do, and you don't want me to do that. So, you know, don't ask for any more. Be happy for what you have to pacify, right? Pacification is a sign of weakness, right? No, the point is, no, I, I can't exist. My people um, can't exist. I can't retain my identity. I can't retain myself of self. I can't retain myself of community, of my social connectedness with others of my kind, with other marginal, marginalized populations, if I'm always being told paternalistically what I ought to do, what I must do, right? No, I have to resist. I have to resist. I'm obligated to resist insofar as any moral imperative tries to pacify my act of resistance, I cannot ascribe to
to that moral imperative. I have to renounce it. Why? Because if I don't, and I set that as my highest moral value, it will collapse on itself, and I will find myself in further oppression. So, again, I mean, infinitely, infinitely, infinitely powerful stuff. Um, and not just powerful, uh, applicable to marginalized populations. And I think one of the biggest misconceptions people have when they hear about Nietzsche, it's just like, oh, it's Nietzsche, he's a Nazi. You know, it's like this default and ridiculous stance, right? Oh, it's Nietzsche, I can't listen to that, I can't, it's anti-Christian. It's without really looking at what the implications of what he's saying are. And for me, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm so methodically, um, slowly, you know, almost painstakingly progressing through the text is that there are gems in the text. And for me, as um, a genocide scholar, as uh, a fledgling race theorist, as uh, a member from a marginalized community myself, I need this stuff in order to conceptualize theoretically. So uh, this, is, this is extremely important. Okay, um, next point on exhaustion. Um, on exhaustion. On exhaustion. Uh, and I actually want to read this. This is from note, note 48 in the text, so let me find it. That text is all messed up. Note 48. Okay, so if you turn to uh, page 30 of the uh, Walter Kaufman translation, um, note 48, it's the second, um, second paragraph. Okay. Uh, I, actually, the first, I'll read from the beginning. The most dangerous misunderstanding, right? The most dangerous misunderstanding. One concept apparently permits no confusion or ambiguity. No confusion or ambiguity. That of exhaustion. So I'm going to take quite a bit of time um, to rather methodically go through Nietzsche's account of exhaustion because it's going to factor quite heavily into our understanding of nihilism, even deeper, right? This, this, this concept of nihilism unfolds very slowly, but very detailed. He's very systematic in this, right? So one concept apparently permits, um, uh, permits no confusion or ambiguity, that of exhaustion. Exhaustion can be acquired or inherited. In any case, it changes the aspect of things, the value of things. Exhaustion changes the aspect. Of things, right? It's something that transforms the aspects of things. Um, the quote that I have uh, right under uh, exhaustion number one: exhaustion can neither be acquired nor uh, inherited. Um, I just want to read the next paragraph, num paragraph number two, and then I'll, I'll flesh it out and make sense of sort of the uh, implications of the paragraph. Quote: As opposed to those who, from the fullness they represent and feel involuntarily, give. So my giving is an act that is involuntarily. I'm not consciously giving of myself. The act of giving is sort of a byproduct of who I am. I'll read that again. As opposed, in opposition to those who, from the fullness they represent and feel, involuntarily give to things and, feel, uh, and see them fuller, more powerfully, and pregnant with future, so those who give, who at least are able to bestow something at least are able to bestow something, those individuals who can give stuff of themselves, the exhausted diminish and botch all they see. They impoverish the values. They are harmful. So the first idea of, of exhaustion is described in an antithetical relationship. You have an individual who involuntarily gives of him or herself, who bestows, according to Nietzsche, something, anything, into the world. Something meaningful, anything meaningful, makes a contribution of some, some form, whatever that contribution might be. And that individual is set in contrast, is antithetical to the exhausted person. The exhausted person sort of just takes, right? There, there isn't any contribution, meaning contribution. And Nietzsche says specifically that the exhausted person is harmful, like right? they're dangerous. Now, let's Let's see how this um, relationship is, is set in opposition. We have uh, what I'm going to call the benefactor. Right? And the benefactor is an individual, as he says, who gives, 
who contributes to value. 